Welcome everyone uh, to Film Roundtable. My name is Maria Prieto and I'm here to lead a conversation with two young directors who I'm also lucky enough to call good friends. But before I introduce them and we dive into the conversation, I'm gonna lead us through a moment of silence to honor all 2,951,145 reported worldwide COVID deaths as of today. We're recording this on April 13th, 2021. We'd also like to honor all of our Black, Brown, and Asian brothers and sisters, as well as our First Nations brothers and sisters, whose lives have been taken by the hands of police brutality and other senseless acts of violence. Thank you. Thanks, guys. This platform, you know, we founded it in the midst of a global pause of a moment when everything shut down and we really had to reflect on, you know, our own impact on society as well as, you know, the film world. And this moment of silence just serves as a continued reflection of that and, you know, just the responsibility that we bear living in this. So with that said, let's, uh, let's jump in. Joining us today, we have Kendall Goldberg, an LA-based writer and director. Kendall's featured directorial debut, When Jeff Tried to Save the World, won the International Film Critics Prize at the 2018 Heartland Film Festival and garnered much praise. Most recently, Kendall created and directed a docuseries pilot for Comedy Central. Kendall, it's so lovely to have you here. Thank you. Thanks, Maria. You did your research. Of course. <laughs> and, um, thanks for having me. This is great. I miss you. Oh, I miss you. Um, yep, and it's good to see your face. And our second guest today is Nina Meredith. Nina's work as a director blurs the line between narrative and documentary with an elegance and ease that has got, not gone unnoticed. Her work has been recognized both internationally and nationally by the Tribeca Film Festival, the Cannes Lions, and the Clios, just to name a few. Nina, welcome to the round table. Oh, it's so good to be here finally. And thanks for having us and uh, for, and for the moment of silence. That was, we don't do that enough in our dailies. So thank you. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, I invited both of you wonderful humans because I admire both your work ethics, the work you put out. And that being said, your work could not be more different. Kendall, you are very comedy driven very high concept stuff that you direct and Nina your stuff is just grounded in this realism and at the same time I just I have a connection with both of your works so that's the reasoning behind putting this together but the first thing I want to open with is a little anecdote of my own um when I was growing up when I was five actually we uh we had to do a, a project in art class that had to do with electricity I don't really know why in art we had to discuss electricity, but I think it was just some kind of competition. Oh, that's what it was. It was a competition brought on by like the Mexican like energy commission. And they had a bunch of uh, preschool kids paint what they thought electricity meant. Like what they pictured when they heard the word electricity and you know, everyone drew their parents' office or the kitchen or you know, just things that obviously use electricity, but Maria, me, I decided to draw a sound stage, like a set within a sound stage, because <laughs> that's what made the most sense to me. And I think that was the moment that I started to have a fascination with this world of filmmaking. You know, the fact that you could walk into this massive building, this warehouse almost, and there was a world within the outside world. So that being said, Kendall, I'll throw this at you first. I'm curious if there's a specific memory you have of what drew you into this creative process. Yeah, um, I wish I had a cool story like that. That's amazing. Um, no, I didn't even know what a soundstage was probably until like high school. Uh, but I, I don't have a specific memory or moment where it just clicked. I um you know was fortunate enough to grow up with my parents kind of like shoving a camera in my face because I was the first born and they filmed literally everything I did um which I'm just now like going through my dad put it on like an online cloud service and it's very boring um but there was there was a clear like uh time where I started 
saying, film me doing this, like watch me do this. And then I was like, hey, no, no, you're doing it wrong. Give me the camera. And so I think it was kind of, it just started when my dad like gifted me his old clunky, uh, you know, mini DV camera or like eight millimeter. And I just started making movies with my friends and, and would, uh, you know, my parents always tell me stories of like, I would force my little sister and my cousin to come over and make movies with me because they were all I had to work with. So um, it just started like that when I was a kid and I just never really made the decision. It was just something that I always did. Do you have a, do you remember any of the things? Like were there, is there a story that you remember filming when you were little? Um, I loved making what I call spy movies, which I think a lot of kids did. It's just like, I'd have this image in my head of me like typing on a keyboard and then there was nothing actually physically in front of me. Like I wasn't in front of a screen or anything, but I just thought that the finished product, there would be like a, a screen projected in the air, you know? And like, I just had these vivid images of like me being like in a spy film and, and they never turned out great because I mean, they, they were very not good because it was just like me doing somersaults on the couch and stuff, you know? But um, I, th I thought that action, I, I kind of thought that I would be into like action and spy movies. I did not, but yeah. That's great. You should yeah. definitely make like a comedy action thriller. Oh yeah. You know, Wonderful. Like, spy. I loved the movie Spy when that came out. I yeah, just thought yeah. that was like such a great mix of comedy and, and, and true action. My parents and I watched that when the pandemic started and we were trying to figure out how to fill our days of emptiness. And it was fantastic it so, brought so much joy to all of us yeah. yeah those are such like fun ones to watch mm -hmm. and a need for more female comedic directors as well so yeah is that nina what about you um the question was like what did i have like this aha like, yeah or even not having an aha like how did you stumble into it yeah it and it was a, a bit of a stumble um mm -hmm. i didn't go to like film school i didn't like grew up with a super eight camera or anything. I, um, I wanted to be an artist, like a painter and a photographer. Um, well, before that I wanted to be like a ballerina and then I wanted to run um, track at the Olympics. None of those things happened. Um, and I, I was a fine artist. I went to school for art and um, art history. And then I, um, I'd be like in the dark room every single day. I was the only film photo major. I kind of like made that major at my college. And um, so I wanted to be a photographer. Um, I interned at a few like New York um, City editorial companies and quickly realized like there's just so much talent out there. Like I, you know, it's kind of like defeated. Like I'll never, I'll never make it. Um, and my mom was like, you should try advertising, maybe going to production. And that's kind of how I started in my 20s as like an assistant producer to producer, um, turned creative producer. And then really at Vice Media is when I started just kind of volunteering, like on super micro budget jobs. I'd like to direct this. Can I try to direct this? You know, it was like $3,000 shoots, $5,000 shoots. And then ultimately that really just snowballed and they kept giving me more and more responsibility and it was like this untapped visual playground for me um mm. and so I feel very fortunate um I think it was like talent and drive like converge and you know now I've been freelance directing for like three and a half four years so it still feels very new um mm. but I, I love it. And it's like this insatiable, give me more, you know, what else can I do? Well, by the look of your work, it does not seem like it's only been three or four years. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Very elevated work. Well, no, Nina, you, you've had a hunger, it seems like, and you were at the right place at the right time with the talent and the hunger. Cause I'm sure there were plenty of people there at Vice who just kind of like skated by, didn't like put the push to get work on their plate and you did and that's why you have the career you have um but you and I we met at a party which haha -ha, remember remember parties <laughs> and I remember what drew me to you is you were talking about a, a short narrative project that you were thinking about writing I don't remember if you had already written a draft but you pitched it and it was this magnificent um story about a young girl and it was coming of age and it was quirky but very grounded in reality 
And that's when I just, I was like, we're probably like, I hope we're friends. Like this is a girl who is driven, who's brilliant, who's smart, but you have very interesting characters in what you write. So I'm curious, one, what inspires these characters and these worlds? And two, once you've thought of them, how do you then start researching? Yeah. That? Yeah. That's, it's interesting because, um, you know, I think people, Kendall, I don't know your process, like probably have some sort of idea of like a story and sit down and write a script. Like for me, it's a little bit maybe different or backwards. Like, and I work with two amazing, amazing writers um, who I love and they've written my, both of my films so far, but I kind of come up with like an archetypal character like someone I'm just so fascinated by, usually it has to do with like a coming of age. I think the one you're talking about was um, the girl uh, studying for her bat mitzvah and wants to become a luchador. Mm -hmm. and I was just like fascinated with like merging of two cultures, two religions, what could that look like? And then the story kind of came like backwards from the character. Mm -hmm. um, same with the bodybuilding film, like I'm obsessed and interested with bodybuilding and it's like what story lies beneath and then the research comes and then the story comes. So I don't know if that's like typical, but that's kind of like, you know, and maybe it's cause like I have like a visual idea of what this could be and then the story starts to build, but I'm just fascinated by like human culture and people and behavior and then realize everyone has a story and like, you have a story, you have a story. Like we can all make films about our lives um, write scripts about whatever, but I'm just so fascinated by this like subculture of like, you know, ethnicity meets sport meets gender and what else can we unveil? Mm -hmm. I'm curious what the writing process with your writing partners is like, I mean, do they, do you flesh out dialogue with them? Like how involved are you with all of that? Um, the first one we did, I had an idea and I kind of wrote like uh, maybe three to five page overview, character breakdown, like some loose acts. And then we're, they're very hands-on. We're all kind of like partners. And so we would then collaborate and really flesh it out together. And they would run ideas by me. And then I would give notes and go back and forth for, for a while. Um, the bodybuilding mm -hmm. one, which is hopefully going to be finished this year, was a little different because I started interviewing real bodybuilders before I um, contacted my writers. And I was like, what is this story? Oh my God, there's that element. No one, I've never heard of that. Or, um, and so that one came very much from like true lives and interviews of body, female bodybuilders. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's a fun process. I don't know. I don't know, Kendall, you probably have a very different way of going about your work. I mean, in the past, I have um, most, of, most of the time, the way I come up with ideas is based off of a location. I'll mm -hmm. think of, you know, a location that I'm interested in putting a camera in. And, and for my first movie, that was a bowling alley. Mm -hmm. And that film exists, you know, about like 80% of it is in the bowling alley. And then I kind of go from there, like, like thinking, um, you know, what characters exist here? What are their lives like? What are the ins and outs? Um, it's, it's actually been a little bit different on newer projects, but I also have a writing partner um, and we started working together like three scripts ago and he and I have just really like figured out our rhythm. Um, sort of similar to what you were saying with your writing partners. It's, um, you know, we'll kind of like create an outline together. We use just like Google Docs, we'll be on the phone because he's in New York. And so we're just constantly on the phone running. If, if it was a landline, we'd be running up the phone bill. Um, and we just kind of create like a full outline until it's like as detailed as like beat by beat as you can get it. Um, mm -hmm. And then we kind of transition to script and we write via, I don't know if you guys have heard of writer duet. Mm -hmm. A screenwriting software i mean it's similar to final draft um but it's it's uh, it's i would describe it like the google docs of of screenwriting because you can live type and see changes that are highlighted in red and so it makes it really easy for when we're working um from far far away and remotely um so that's how we've been doing it recently but yeah i mean i i think it's so cool that you 
you know, have this blend kind of of like Maria was saying, doc and and scripted because you know, I was just talking to, I was just playing tennis this morning, talking to the, uh, the guy I was playing with. And he was just like, the most interesting stories and dialogue you hear on the courts, like you cannot write that. And so talking to people, like talking to those bodybuilders, I'm sure you just come up with things you would have never thought of. And that is just like the, to me, the most interesting way to tell a story, like blending the truth with, you know, your own version of, of a scripted narrative piece. It's, this is kind of reminding me of uh, one of my first shorts, which Kendall was the first AD on The Fridge. And uh, the story is about um, a man, a widowed man, who is estranged from his son. And one day he wakes up and there's a fridge on his lawn. And he has to call his son for to help move it, move the fridge. And the son actually, when he arrives, like the son doesn't see the fridge. And there's like an element of magical realism and you know, at the end, it's the father apologizing to his son for never accepting his sexuality. Um, but w the inspiration behind the short was my grandfather and a specific moment when my own grandmother had died and I saw him um, speaking to her, like to a picture of her after she had passed. And that just stuck with me for probably like six years until I wrote it. And yeah, it was just drawing inspiration from like a real life moment and that gave birth to a whole world that, you know, wasn't related to that. But um, I want to, you know, sidestep from that, Kendall, because I want to talk about When Jeff Tried to Save the World, which is your bowling alley movie. Mm -hmm. And you directed this right after, well, the feature right after we left film school. But prior to that, there was a whole journey to get there. Um, so I'd love for you to kind of share a bit about how you were able to direct a feature at such a young age, but at the same time, all of the, the you know, roadblocks that you had to overcome. Yeah. Well, to summarize, uh, I had a different writing partner for this movie. Um, she and I went to high school together. We were really good friends. Oh my God, you guys took the same, the sip at the same time of the same exact drink. I know I did that on purpose to mess okay, up. Okay, that was perfect. <laughs> really threw me off there, Nina. Um, <laughs> So we wrote this movie, uh, I believe it was the summer after my freshman year, I was like, you know, hey, we're, I'm writing shorts for film school. Um, let's try and write something together. So we wrote this and it ended up turning into just a bigger movie. It was just, it just was a feature. It's not like I really set out to make one then. Um, but then I had this concept, I had this idea and I was like, okay, I, let's make this, let's make this. It's gonna be really easy. We can just whip it together because it's a good script and we can get money and we can cast and look like snap of a finger. And I'm saying this as like a sophomore in college, um, <laughs> having truly no idea what it takes to make a feature film, which um, I credit that to be my naivety to being like the reason I was able to make it um, because I just didn't know what to expect and I wasn't scared of anything. I like, you know, had no idea how many no's I'd get. And then just every time I got a no, I was like, okay, like keep moving, keep moving. So I had been trying to make this movie every summer throughout college because I figured summer was my only chunk of like two months that I could take, you know, the time to make a movie. And as time would go by and I like could not figure out how to finance it or I'd get some cast attached, but then like the money didn't come through or vice versa. Um, I decided to take a step back and condense the feature into a proof of concept short. Uh, looking back, it was like much too long. It was like 20 pages, ended up being 22 minutes long. It did the job at the time, but if I were to do it again, I probably would make a little bit more of like a cohesive, shorter version. So we just kind of, we decided instead of, um, we'd contemplating taking a scene from the movie and making it into a short, but decided so that we could submit it to festivals to, to make it a beginning, middle and end, shorter version of the full movie. Um, I had been through some casting sessions. I had John Heater, who plays the lead um, from Napoleon Dynamite, he plays the lead in the movie, Jeff. I'd had him like, interested in the movie after an audition and I just kind of kept in touch with him and when I decided to make this proof of concept I told him I was like hey look we found this amazing bowling alley after searching for over 40 bowling alleys we found the one it's home where I'm from in Chicago like we're gonna go there for four days in August of this was 2016 so this is right after my junior year we're gonna go shoot this like would you like to be in it and he was like yeah sure 
So <laughs> luckily I got him and the rest of the cast to agree to come. We shot this short, we submitted it to festivals. I had a production company sort of tell me if the short was good, they would put their name on it. And like, we could use that for getting the rest of the money that we needed for the feature. And that sort of sealed the deal and helped us piece together the puzzle. So that then I came back my senior year, made my senior thesis, which John came to cameo in. And then we um, shot the movie. We had what we needed to shoot the movie the following year, just right when I graduated. So, I mean, when I say it like that, it sounds like it just kind of all fell together and it worked out perfectly, but it took a very long time of me you know, really truly working on it nonstop every single day. I mean, Maria can attest, even when we met and I was first ADing her shorts, I was probably trying to talk about this movie all the time. I wouldn't shut up about it. Um, and I think just having that eagerness and the excitement and the naivety of thinking I would make it sooner than I actually did led to me getting it done right after I graduated. Um, so yeah, it was a long time coming, but, you know, looking back on it, it, it was... Uh, an impressive feat. I, I'm proud of myself. Is, I mean, I started watch. Sorry to chime in. Like, I started watching it this week. Um, easily accessible on Amazon. It has 99% on Rotten Tomatoes. Like, I texted Maria. I was like, "How old is this girl?" Like, that is so <laughs> impressive. Your the ensemble, the cast is obviously like superstar actors now, and I think it's something I'm very envious of. Probably a lot of older directors are as well, but. What you did was amazing and it's a Thank really you. great film. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, I'm definitely really proud of it. And I think, you know, my biggest takeaway was just to, the, the, I say this in every interview I've ever done for this film because I think it's the best advice I've ever been given, the most handful advice. And it was from um, one of my mentors and professors who Maria knows, Roy Finch. And it was that in the future, your film has already been made and to think about the present as like just you finding the path and going to that right fork or the left fork of, of what gets the movie made. So like if you just, you know, close your eyes and picture it premiering in a theater down the road, like now you're just trying to figure out who's actually involved in it when it's completed and who's not and, you know, how it actually gets made. So with that mentality, I feel like I was able to kind of push through people ignoring me when I want to talk about it and the no's and, you know, the prom, the empty promises, like I was able to sort of get over that hump and just be like, no, I am telling, that was another thing is after I started telling everyone that I was making this, I became like, you know, a little embarrassed as each summer would go by that I'd said, oh, I'm making it this mm -hmm. summer. And then I'd come back to college and I didn't. Yeah. And in the long run, I, you know, nobody probably was like, oh my God, look at her. She's trying to make this movie and she's not able to. I think after I made it, everyone's like, wow, she really did it. But, you know, I think by saying it out loud, I was kind of committing to it. Mm -hmm. um, I even like posted on Facebook one time and immediately deleted it because I was like, this is, a, this is a bad idea. I'm getting ahead of myself. But I think by, by telling everyone, you're kind of like putting it out there, manifesting it. You're like, I set the dates. It's this August, you know, we're doing it. Are, do you have financing? Um, yeah. Totally. Right, right. You know, just like really going with it. The, the fake it till you make it mentality is very real. Yeah, Nina, the word you said, like envious is exactly like Kendall. This is a trait of yours that I've admired and envied since we met. And I think it's one of the reasons that I adore our friendship so much is because you are one of the like most driven people I know and have been since I met you at a time when I wasn't really sure if I had it in me. Um, and I think that's so important, especially in this industry, to surround yourself with friends who are working at it and, you know, just reminding you that, like, it's still a struggle for them, but, like, they just, like, keep doing it. Like, you got so many no's, but, like, that didn't deter you ever. Like, you just kept going for it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I just think that's massively important. Well, you definitely have it in you, Maria. And, and I know that because we spend so much time together, but I think, like, now that I've finished that project and have been trying, you know, I shot it in 2017, released it in 2018, have been trying to get the next things going. The most helpful thing to me has been surrounding myself by people like you. Mm -hmm. um, no matter what projects you've made, feature or not, like just being able to kind of like rant together, um, talk about our doubts that we all share, you know, like we have a lot of amazing director friends and everyone has the same 
feelings you know mm -hmm. even even you know one of our good friends who's already made a feature like he's always doubting himself and like how can i make a second how do, am i am i you know imposter syndrome it's mm -hmm. like something that we all go through and i think the only way to get through it which you, you're going to continue to feel those feelings is to talk about it with like-minded filmmakers yeah no totally. i was talking to um the director i just lost like a huge commercial and i was talking to another director and it's like that's some just that little notion of losing or a small failure in the moment is something we don't talk enough about, especially director to director to director. Like mm -hmm. we all share these same doubts and feelings and, you know, we're all self-conscious of our own work. And it's something I'm really trying to make more director friends and like learn from each other, share each other's stories. I think it's so important, like talking about the ups and, and of course the downs, because I think we, always put this image out or facade out and like it's all great like we saw your film and we're like oh it must have been so easy for Kendall you know but we don't talk about the really crazy challenges to get to that end place yeah it's true well Nina we can be friends so we can talk oh, about okay, all this. <laughs> okay, well, I'll cheers to that <laughs> mm. Nina actually I, I want to talk a little bit about the commercial world and I mean, Kendall, I think you had some questions about this too. Um, and I, actually just talking about rejection, like, has it been something that the more you pitch on projects, the easier it is to just say like, okay, whatever, on to the next. Or it, are there certain campaigns where it's like, it hurts a lot? Uh, I mean, as a director on commercial pitches, you have to invest so much time. You're basically putting so much of your heart into each job, each treatment that you have to submit. Um, and if you don't get it, like, I just, I kind of want to talk through those feelings yeah. after. I don't, I hope it gets easier. Cause like I woke up to a, a, um, email and call from my, one of my producers that I didn't get a job. And I think I almost like broke down and into tears because I was like, what do I have to do? Like, in my opinion, my treatment was near perfect, like amazing imagery, like I put every, you know, you put eight, 10 days into these treatments, writing this and that. And every time I go in feeling really confident mm -hmm. and then when you're about to lose it, to me, it's this very gut, like instinctual feeling where I'm like, okay, I would have known by now. And so I mentally prepare, but it's always, it's, it's, hurt, it's hurtful because you take it personally, you can't, but of course you do. They're judging you as an artist. They have the say over who's directing this film, this commercial. Um, so yeah, it's really painful. And I think people are like, oh, you know, look on the bright side, you're in the bidding pool, you're bidding against really talented directors. Most are much older, most are men. Um, mm -hmm. And so I'm like, yeah, that's, that's cool, but it would feel a little sweeter to win all mm -hmm. of them or 50% more of them, mm -hmm. but then, you got a Super Bowl commercial or you get like one a Ford Bronco ad and you're like, okay, that's pretty damn cool. I guess I am deserving and talented and all of those things, but it's tough. It's really tough when other people have the full control over yeah. you as an artist, you become a commodity. Um, I love commercial directing. I really do, but there are very painful times um, that I think we don't talk enough about. I was going to ask this much later, but, you know, during the quarantine, you got very into pottery. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious if, you know, this creative outlet that has nothing to do with filmmaking has served as also like a therapy to help yeah. you through those moments. Absolutely. It is therapy. You, um, and that goes back to like my love of fine arts. Like I did pottery all through high school and when I was younger and, um, the second week of lockdown, I bought my own wheel because I was just like, I'm gonna probably go crazy if I don't have something to do um, outside of the career. And it's been amazing. I love pottery. I love making things for my friends, for my peers. Um, it's, a, it's a beautiful outlet. Um, your hands are physically dirty. You're super laser focused, lost in the moment. Um, you know, everyone makes like a, a ghost joke or whatever, but it's, um, 
it's just so fun. I think it's like being in the dark room or like, you know, just out going for a run or anything to just take your mind off of it for an hour. Mm -hmm. I'd like to put my name on the list for like a mug or something because I just took my very first pottery class. My boyfriend got us like a pack of four classes and just took them. And it was a mix of frustration because it's so hard. And then when I got it, it was incredibly cathartic. And I was like, I need to do this again. Yeah. But that sounds incredible having your own wheel. Yeah. I mean, much like winning a job, it's frustrating when it goes off center and you lose for like one thing. But then once you have the most perfect bowl or mug or anything, you feel like the most pride. Um, and at least with pottery, it's in your control, whether <laughs> you like mess it up or not. <laughs> Sometimes. Like, get off the wheel. But yeah. I'll make, I'll make you a mug. I promise. It's funny, Nina, I have to send you pictures because my parents still proudly display the pottery that my sister and I made when we were like four or five. (laughs) Oh, sweet. We made when we lived in Mexico, not even painted. I actually, I texted the pictures to Allison Anderson once and I was like, Nina has competition. (laughs) Really, really, really. But it's cute how proud my parents are. Oh, that's sweet. Kendall, I mean, clearly you just took your first pottery class, but what kind of creative outlet do you have that's not really film related? Um, I play the drums. Oh yes, you're a fantastic drummer. It's just for fun. Um, I've been playing since I was in like middle school, so at least I can jam a little. Uh, that's a great uh, stress reliever. Real, real quick for, uh, for those listening and not watching, there is actually a drum set right behind Kendall. True. It's true. She's not lying. Um, I also box. I love boxing. I've been doing it for like three years, just like, you know, for cardio, but it's like become, you know, my best, one of my favorite activities and stress relievers. I've gotten into tennis lately. Um, Used to play as a kid, kind of let it go and then picked it back up. I've been playing with friends, you know, because it's a safe COVID activity. Um, I tried baking bread. I'm not good at it. Uh, but I also probably didn't give it enough of a try. Uh, you know, I've really kind of given my hand at a lot of things. I was painting a lot, doing some watercolors during the quarantine. It brought out my other artistic side. So it was, it was good to sort of find other hobbies. I feel like truly up until like a year or two ago, when people would ask me what my hobbies are, I didn't have an answer because it was like just film. I was like, uh, watching movies. I don't know but it feels better to have other things to put your time into when you have those frustrations and like, you know, you lose a job and, or you you don't win the bid and it's just like, okay, let me do something else and focus my energy on that for a little. Well, because you're also opening up channels of creativity from other mediums that aren't like solely this like hyper-focused world of film that we do live in way too much. So, you know, you could find inspiration for a character, for a story based on these other activities that you're immersing yourself in. What do you do, Maria? I cook. I cook so much. I cook. I mean, there was a point where I was cooking for my entire family during the pandemic. So I would cook like like, breakfast, lunch and dinner, right? I would do. I would do lunch and dinner six days a week. (laughs) Crazy. Yeah, so I would be like in the kitchen for, and I like to make intricate meals. It's not like, you know, sandwiches. Like I want to like go all in and we were pretty vegan at the time. So it was like very intricate vegan meals. Um, But it's, I think it's because as opposed to writing a script or as opposed to working on set where it's, you know, a long-term project, this is something where you see the result immediately. Also, you could shoot something and then you get in the edit and you're really upset because you're like, crap, I should have shot that differently. Or, you know, you realize you missed something important. But when you're cooking, you kind of can fix things pretty easily. Um, yeah, so that's where I, where I get that. But Kendall, you mentioned boxing. And this brings me to a question for Nina, because Nina, just as Kendall took us through her When Jeff Tried to Save the World, journey. Um, I want to hear a little bit about your journey with Princess, which is the documentary that you're working on about Mariah Bahi, who, for those listening, um, she's a Navajo Nation teenager who's attempting to become the first female Navajo boxer to win an Olympic title. That's like the coolest sentence ever. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, (laughs) I'm so blessed to um, have had and continue to have time with this family. They are just the most remarkable and grounded and kind spirited people. Um, 
it, again, it started with, you know, the archetype. Like I read one line headline about this, this girl, she was 14 at the time. And I was like, what? Like, I have to, I have to know more about this. Um, and I emailed her father maybe a dozen times and I never got a response. And then through like a mutual friend, I producer, I got hit of the article she was in. I got, um, got his cell phone number and he answered immediately. And he's like, I don't, I don't really check my email. I'm sorry, but we're going to be at a competition boxing match in Salt Lake city next week. If you want to um, like meet us. And I, Sean, my fiance comes from feature doc background. And I looked at him and I was like, let's just go. We'll fly on my miles and, you know, use our Hilton points and meet this family. Cause I just, something in, inside of me was like, I need to explore this. Um, after watching her box, she's a phenomenal boxer, but then going to dinner with this family and hearing a little bit about where they come from, their journey. And I was like, has anyone filmed you guys before? And they were like, we get a lot of inquiries, but we're very protective. Um, Navajo Nation is very protective. So we've been apprehensive and it's like we'll take it as slow as you guys need and want and we before we started filming it was about six months I would just keep in touch with them call them every week really show them I'm, I'm a good person I'm committed to telling your story you know with the the purest intentions because that was they were very nervous of that and um and I took you know my commercial directing money and invested it in this film and we followed her for two years and it's supposed to I wanted to I want to follow her for eight years and everyone was like there's no way um, you can get an eight-year like documentary funded why don't you just start with like one two years see how it goes and um, it's been the best experience of my you know filmmaking life because it was just so beautiful getting to know this family. The first time we went and filmed, let alone on Super 16, which maybe isn't the best medium for a Verite documentary. Um, they were like, we're going to DJ at our neighbor's Suite 16. Do, do you and the crew, there was four of us want to come and film and be guests. And I was like, wow, how cool is that? Like in what other world would you get invited? in you know the small town on Navajo Nation to a sweet 16 and um it was this really like out of body experience where I told my crew like put your put the cameras down let's just like be in the moment mm -hmm. yes we might be missing some cool footage but let's just be in the moment and um in Navajo the the mother got, gets on the microphone and thanks us us being at this party and I was just like you know I haven't seen a documentary or film um, really done that has not exploited this community or been um, about the missing people, which those are very serious things, but I wanted to tell a uplifting story, a positive story, one where we can celebrate Native American girls. And that's what Mariah is all about is being a role model to her girls in her community. Um, the pandemic hits, Navajo Nation is in lockdown, still are. We've had a tremendous pause. I sent the family DV cameras to self tape. But in the meantime, the Olympic channel came along and they said, um, can you make a short film of what you shot? We want, we want it for our channel. And I thought that was an amazing idea. It would get the family more exposure. It would get the film more exposure. And so we turned it into like a 17 minute documentary, which is um, now getting into film festivals, which is really exciting. Um, but we're itching to get back there as soon as we can. It's, it's so important to have side projects, personal projects, passion projects. Sometimes they go places, sometimes they definitely don't. But um, it's been like just such a humbling experience um, learning from this now, 17 year old girl um, and I'm really proud of her and and the family they're just the most remarkable people mm. that's amazing 
Mm. Yeah, no, it, it's yeah. really, it, I mean, for those who haven't seen the short, it's absolutely, it's fantastic. And Nina, it's on the doc, in the Olympic channel, right? Olympicchannel.com, yeah. And um, I can't say some festivals it just got into, but it will be playing at some exciting festivals this year. Um, so. I'm curious, cause I, I've never done a documentary. Um, but in terms, I mean, I'm sure they're all different in the way you craft the story behind it, but in this specific um, story, have you crafted out the narrative of it beforehand and gone into it like kind of knowing what scenes you wanted to get? Or do you just go, you show up, you shoot what you get, and then you find it in the edit? Like, how has it been? It's such a hard process. I think the hardest question in doing grants or applications that people want to know, how does it end? Mm. And I can't say how it ends. I can imagine how it might end. And so I would write like three different versions of this is maybe how it ends, but who really knows that's right. in four, eight years. Um, but what I quickly learned was this is not a boxing story. It's not a rock, rocky story. It's, it's about the Native American community and growing up as a teenager on this small, in the small town of Chinle and being this figure, this almost celebrity, she gets stopped everywhere she goes and she's a very introverted, shy young woman. Mm. Um, so to me, it was so much more of a story of her navigating the waters of her teenage years, her relationship with her four brothers, with her father, who's her coach, with her mother, who's her coach, with her grandmother. It's like a whole beautiful family affair. Um, and so I would call them and be like, what's, what's coming up? What do you guys have going on? And they would say, um, you know, we're hauling wood and then we're driving 18 hours to the next competition. And I would say, okay, we'll meet you there. Or I would say, um, oh, it's your 16th birthday. Can we come, can we come visit you and film? And I have an outline, I would have questions and thoughts, but you have to just be so reactive in the moment. Um, and they would just be like, okay, we're going, we're going here now. And I'd say, okay, can we follow you? Um, Sean has so much more experience than I did at this time in um, documentary where he would kind of advise me, like, let, let this scene breathe, let it be. Cause I was very used to commercial directing where I'd be like, and now, you know, can you sit this way and can you do this and let's find your light and whatever. And he would just kind of lightly tap me and be like, just, five minutes, let's see what happens. Mm -hmm. And they forget the cameras there and this beautiful conversation emerges or whatever. Um, and so you have a plan, you have an idea, but often it totally goes out the window and you just have to follow your intuition and, and be really reactive. Um, I think you can tell in documentary where a director is inserting way too much. You know, I think the best documentaries are like, the talent has no idea this film is being made on them. Mm -hmm. um, and that to me comes from just building a severe amount of trust with your subjects and with the talent before you ever start filming. People say, don't get close to your subjects. I find it really hard not to because I end up loving my subjects. Um, but there is a line you have to draw. Like after a loss, I personally wanted to go hug her but we had to stay back and look at it through the lens. Um, so it's this very fine line when you're filming someone for a, an extended period of time to not get so close that it ever tampers with the film. Right. No, it's interesting what you said about when Sean, you know, taught, not taught you, but mentioned like, just let this breathe, let it be which that restraint as a director, isn't really something that you think it's counterintuitive. Cause you're like, Nope. I have to control it. But at the same time, you can learn so much from that. And it's a little more difficult in the commercial world because you have the agency there and you know, everything's kind of like, go, go, go. But you can, th that's where you find some magic. Like in those moments where you let it just kind of like happen before you, cause you can't control magic. Like magic, I mean, you, if you're a magician, of course you're fully in control of magic, but like real magic. Isn't I guess control. that's the next hobby is becoming a magician. <laughs> I wanted to be a magician for so long. Do you know, do you know magic tricks? Just a few. <laughs> <laughs> Just a few. Um, that's another, another uh -oh. podcast. 
another podcast. And on the next episode, she'll be doing close-up magic. Yeah. But I, I've worked with a lot of actors and I uh, take direction courses and every actor says like, and Judith Weston, I just listened mm. to her. Oh, obsessed. Yeah. Oh, sh- oh my God. And Maria, back to one thing you said earlier about finding a lot of inspiration in personal stories. Like she advocates very much for that, but she says directors talk way more than they have to. Mm. And that's something I think the beauty in um, directing, and I tried to direct with very few words um, because so many actors say, okay, after two sentences, I'm not really listening or like, just give me the top line and I'll go from there. And I think directors often feel the need to overcompensate. Like on the Nike job I did with Michael B. Jordan, I remember I was so nervous and I was doing that like anxiety over directing thing. And he was like, Nina, I I got you. Mm. And that was like all he had to say. And it just put me at ease um, because he's obviously such a professional that I just had to say like two words to him every scene we would do. And obviously he, he is an, a magician with his ways, but um, I think there's a beauty in stepping back and doing a little bit less. Mm-hmm. Well, going back to our, our lady Judith, who I, I know we all love very much. Yeah. Um, Kendall, I'll throw it at you first. I mean, for me, I have the book next to my bed. Like it's, it's almost a really Bible. Right. Yeah, it's right. Yeah. yeah. How often are you referring to her material? Is it something that you feel, I mean, at least for me, every time I read it, it's new. Like, because mm-hmm. every project you're dealing with different characters, yeah. you're dealing with different material. But um, do you find yourself even between projects referring to it or do you just like let it lay while you're not you know physically directing well you know there's so much in her book that and director's intuition that like you just you forget some of the stuff that's in there so like anytime I go back to it I'll remember like there's new material um I look at it more intensely when I know I'm ramping up for production but I definitely have like I utilize script analysis, like this, the chapters that she wrote on script analysis for my writing, because I do think that like analyzing it like I'm usually when I write something, it's because I'm going to direct it. So analyzing it like I'd be directing it, I will then kind of go back into the script and like it'll help me rework things and make it better. Um, I took I took one on ones with her when I was prepping for my movie in college and it was when she was still offering classes. I know now, I'm pretty sure now it's only like one-on-one sessions. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't know. Have you worked with her in person? Oh, that's what she said though. I just listened. She's doing a reading every Friday. Yeah, she does those Zooms and they're amazing. Yeah, so I just did it um, Friday. Yeah. With a director friend and she says she still does the one-on-ones. She still does the one-on-ones and they're, I mean, obviously she's trained a, a bunch of amazing directors I'm sure we all love. Um, but it really taught me a lot about my script. And there's one comparison that she drew to when Jeff tried to save the world that I'll never forget. Um, and I mean, it's, it's a very long story to explain like how I utilized it when directing, but she drew the comparison to Winnie the Pooh Mm. because Jeff is kind of like a little bit more of like an internal passive character. And he lets like his struggles are more internal than they are external, even though there's this whole plot line with the bowling alley closing. And that's like Winnie in Winnie the Pooh. And and then there's all these, you know, other characters that surround him in the bowling alley, these quirky characters that are like Tigger and Piglet. And she just like drew this comparison to Winnie the Pooh. And that's when I knew I was like, oh my God, I need to like step out of like the script that I know, which, you know, because I wrote it, it's, you can only be objective to a certain degree. And then, and she just, I like, I recommend the book to everyone. I'm like, she taught me so much, you know, it's not like a blueprint for directing because there is none, but it's about as close as it gets in my opinion. Do you have the new, the new edition? I didn't get the new edition, but I kind of want to. I have the audio book. I listen to the audio book (laughs) while I'm reading. Like I'm obsessed. (laughs) She um, read a passage. She like went over the chapters and there were a few she said are very edited and revised in the 25th edition. But, um, she read a passage and it it was um, like a very personal story to her and she got very emotional and everyone in the class or audience got very emotional and she just has this 
beautiful calming presence to her. Mm -hmm. I feel like she's just so un unbelievably wise. I recommend the book to everyone too. I recommend, I also do a directing actors class with a, another teacher in LA, it's over Zoom now. And I recommend that to all my fellow actors too. What is it? It's, um, it's just called Directing Actors. It's word of mouth. Um, the teacher is Adrian and Brad. Um, Brad does the West Coast one. And I've taken this class because I never had formal training. So it's kind of my version. Um, I've taken it the past like four or five years and it's just, you work with different actors each week. You perform in front of the class. He gives you adjustments and everything is so much easier when he comes in. But it's um, it's been so helpful for my transition to working with actors and narrative directing. Nina, I am curious how that's been over Zoom, how those sessions have run and either like the difficulties or yeah, just like walk us through that a little. The first, um, cause when I was um, doing rehearsals for the bodybuilding film, it also was in the middle of the pandemic. So that was also on Zoom. Mm -hmm. I think after the first one, you get really used to it. You know, the difference, to me, it's great because you're focused so much on the text and this static frame, right? Like you're not getting lost in spatial environments and blocking and things like that. So it, to me, it was like going back to basics. Um, and I really like it. I got very used to it. And I think the actors are just as strong and compelling over Zoom. Um, and then I think when you do get in person and on set, it'll feel so much easier, you know, after going through a Zoom rehearsal or performance. Um, but yeah, it's been totally fine. I don't know if, no, Kendall, you go. I was just gonna ask you, Nina, I don't know if you've done any remote commercials. I did one over Zoom and it was, it was quite an interesting experience. Have you had the chance to do any? Yeah, I did one with our friend, John Chima. Um, for Peloton and um, I don't like it um, because I am a very physical director on set. I love going up and having these chats with the performers and it's in that intimate bubble where I feel like I can work best. Um, so yeah, it was weird having people listen to me, my direction and the questions and then the awkward tech and you know, all of that. Um, I don't love it and I would prefer never to do it again, but uh, you know, hopefully we're progressing. And um, I, I did a lot of commercials in person over quarantine too. So they'll ask sometimes what your preference is and mine is always in person. Of course, yeah. Quick it, shout out to John Chima, who has also been a film roundtable panelist. Yes, and happy belated birthday. And happy belated, of course. Um, Kendall, you you did one as well for Svedka. I did, yeah. Uh, experience it, on that. It was interesting. I kind of completely agree with you, Nina. I'm like, I was like over it before it began. Wanted to to be in person, but. Um, it was with a 92, the, the woman was 92 years old. Her name is Batty Winkle. She's like, an Batty. Yeah. Batty. And it, she, and she was like rapping. It was kind of like a music video for the vodka company Svedka. So it was, it was like, it would have been difficult in person, but, mm -hmm. um, she is very with it. It's just, you know, like getting a 92 year old woman to lip sync a rap song that was written literally hours before the shoot, you know, was difficult um and I wish I could have been there I mean she was great she was a real hoot and like cooperating through the iPad that was set up there on a tripod but I felt bad I was like I wanted to be there you know touching your shoulder like you know I'm a, also a very like touchy director and I just need you know being in the space with someone it's it's like there's no comparison how do you um I imagine directing for you it's a lot about timing in comedy, like how do you gauge that? How do you, and that's another question, like what if it's not landing? How do you correct that? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Well, um, most of my experience is narrative. I'm kind of, I would say like, you know, I've been doing some commercial work but it's not nearly to the extent that you have. The commercial world just boggles my mind. Um, I, I, in the narrative world, I'll speak on that. I 
I usually, um, when it comes to comedic timing, I know that if I'm not laughing and if I'm not in it and if like my close like department heads and collaborators are not enjoying it and don't think that the take was funny, then it usually that's when I know something's not working because I don't, I don't really, I haven't done any like slapstick. Like I, I do maybe like a little kind of magical realism here and there, elevated reality, um, but only to like two clicks away from reality, you know, like I want it to still be like we're in it and we're experiencing it and I'm doing things like for myself as an audience. So if, if I'm not feeling it, usually um, I can tell in the moment. But then again, there are times where, you know, you get into the editing room and you're just like, okay, that did not work at all. Luckily for when Jeff tried to save the world, we, you know, we were in that bowling alley for three weeks of the four week shoot. Um, and we had our editor editing throughout the shoot. So we were able to kind of see like what was working and what wasn't and could reshoot if we needed to because we were there and we had ac full access. It was closed down for us, which was a huge luxury and something I'm prepared to never experience quite like that again. Um, but yeah, I, we, we really didn't run into any major problems we had to redo, but small things that we realized that you know could easily be fixed. Kendall, I mean, you are an incredible first AD um, and an incredible director. And I've also, I've first AD'd a few things. And you for me- You're also an incredible first AD. Well, thank you, thank you. But it, it's tough for me to then separate those roles. So I'm curious for you, if you also kind of run into that problem where like you're still, you want to, you know, be on top of like the schedule and like where everything fits and, you know, you're realizing like, oh my gosh, we're, we've been in the scene for too long. Or if you're able to kind of step away from that. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I produce most of my own work with, with other producers. So I do like to be full as fully involved as I can handle until I need to just kind of like step away a couple weeks before and just be creative. Um, for when Jeff tried to save the world, a specific story where I did kind of have to be an AD for a little bit, and I was glad I had that experience, you know, our good friend and my DP, Nico, um, he and I kind of had to take over. We, we went through three first ADs on that shoot. The first week we had someone um, we loved and unfortunately had to leave because he got financing for his own film. The second week uh, was just someone who wasn't a good fit for the project. And so Nico and I really had to step up and like, and it was also the hardest week of the shoot with like over 150 extras, steady cam warners. It was just kind of chaotic. We had to step up and just keep on schedule ourselves. And it was something that, you know, I was constantly thinking about. Did it detract from like me working and being like fully available and accessible to my actors? Probably. I, I don't know, you know, like I actually really haven't thought about that much, but um, on projects like music videos and, and smaller things where I can have more of my brain thinking about the schedule, I do. Like I create that all myself pretty much. Mm -hmm. I've done a lot of smaller projects recently without first ADs, so I've had to do it myself but it just goes to show me that the first AD is one of the most invaluable assets um to have and I've yet to find someone honestly besides you Maria that I've like really enjoyed working with as a first AD when I'm a director and I think it's just like kind of like your script supervisor like for me I felt like my script supervisor um Rachel is someone I need by my side at all times and I feel like it's the same for the first AD I don't know. Yeah. How do you feel, Maria? Like when you direct, you are you able to? Well, I mean, you have. I've luckily had you by my side for some of the bigger projects I've done, and then the smaller ones, I've kind of just put it upon myself. Which for one specific music video, I put, it was too much on my plate, and I think it did kind of hinder some of my creativity. Um, but yeah, I do think if you find the right person, I mean, they're they're your right hand man. They're they're ensuring that all of the aspects of the production that you that are really important but as a director you can kind of just let it be on their plate and if you don't trust that person it's continues to just be like you know this mosquito flying in your head that's a really hard thing for me too and something that I'm actively trying to get better at is trusting other people I have very high standards and I've just been burned a lot in the past as I'm sure you guys have and like will continue to be because it's difficult to find 
amazing department heads. Um, and I have really high standards for myself. And I like most often will hold those standards, especially for like my friends that I work with. And that's sometimes where I, not you, Maria, but that's sometimes where I run into trouble is because you just, you know, assume that people will work as hard for your project as you will. Mm. And it was a realization I came to when making my first feature that like no one will care about the movie as much as you do because it's your baby, it's your passion project. It's great to find and surround yourself with the people who do care on that level, but like setting yourself up for like knowing that, you know, um, you will be the one to care the most throughout it, I think was something that helped save me. A mm -hmm. little bit. Yeah, I think that the AD too, like I have yet to find someone I really click with. There's one um, woman in Chicago who I did a job with and I, loved and like her passion for the project her attitude everything was so amazing um, but here in LA it's been really hard um, finding someone who like like wants to be there as much as you do and maybe like our expectations are a little off filter but um, yeah I agree it's like it is hard sometimes finding your people but when you do you're like you get so protective over them whether it's your editor or DP or audio mix or whatever. And I, um, I find myself recommending people all the time because I don't want to be protective over anyone. Like those people should be getting as many jobs as, as we should all put people forward for. Um, that was kind of a shift later in, in my like late twenties, I was like, what am I doing? Like, I want to support other filmmakers, especially other female filmmakers. Let me give them all of my suggestions. And so I, I'm like such an open book in that way, but yeah, I agree. It's really hard sometimes finding your people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, that's interesting. You mentioned that out, you know, I was thinking about that recently where I feel like I've gotten a little better too at when people come to me for suggestions being like these are my favorite people and you should work mm -hmm. with them too because you know that if it's the right partnership on your end that they'll come back and always want to work with you as long as it works out you know it's not like you need to hold them captive and like keep them a secret yeah. no this is my toy <laughs> I actually growing up I had a really good friend whose name I won't name but when she was little this is way before I knew her when she was like three or four anytime she had a play date she would hide all of her toys <laughs> No one was allowed to play with them, but her. This is my like princess die beanie baby. Exactly. Exactly. And you're right. Like as a director, you're like, no, no, no one can know about this. But no, at the same time, we're all artists. We all need to be working our craft as much as we can. Um, but yeah, it, it is a silly notion that we have this like overprotectiveness. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. That was one thing I liked about where Maria and I went to uh, film school, Chapman, was it felt like it was a little bit less of a competitive vibe than a lot of other film schools. People were just like always helping each other. Mm -hmm. And it set me up, I think, on a good path, like um, confidence wise, because I was not getting insecure when someone was like making a project. I would be like, let me help you, you know, and like vice versa. People are always willing to help. And I just think like, that's how you come up, you know, with the, with your peers. Like that is how you, you rise and succeed. You help others and they help you. 100%. Multiple people can actually climb the ladder together. It's not like a one rung ladder. It's a really wide ladder. Super. It's a super yeah, wide yeah. Yeah. We all have an elevator. Actually, we can fit a ton of people in here. I agree. I pass on, I pass on jobs. Um, that came out kind of wrong. Like if I can't do a job or a job's not right for me, I'm, always giving um you know the names of my friends and my peers to that client or brand or agency all the time there is so much room in this industry for so many people mm -hmm. um this kind of brings me to my lightning round of questions for the two of you uh yeah are you guys ready i'm like yeah i'm sweating <laughs> Lukewarm. We'll start, this, we'll start this. We'll start this with Kendall because I want to put you on the hot seat first, and then Nina, you can answer, and then the next one, Nina, you'll answer, and then Kendall will answer. And uh, since it is director happy hour, if you don't want to answer, you just have to take a sip of your wine. Oh, nice. Okay. What are we doing? <laughs> um. All right, Kendall. So, what's your favorite crafty snack? Oh, Rice Krispies. 
Nina? Pickles. You have pickles or crafty? Pickles are my number one rider. I will just say that till the end. Gotta have the pickles. All right, good to know. Um, for me, um, oh, there was one crafty woman in New York when I PA'd years ago who would always have this, um, well, she would have permissions, which are very rare to have on set. And then she would also make this like pumpkin bread that was just divine. But I guess if it's just like normal crafty, maybe like hummus and pita. That's good, yeah. Um, all right, Nita, the movie you've seen the most? Um, like, this is so embarrassing, not embarrassing. Harry Potter, one through eight, I watch it twice a year with Sean. Um, and then it's tied for like the prestige casino and the Godfather. <laughs> like those are my kind of top three go-tos. Mine is probably the prestige. My sister and I will just randomly quote scenes from it. When you were talking about electricity, that's where my mind went. <sighs> Girl, we need to do a prestige night. <laughs> All right, Kendall. I've actually never seen the prestige. So let's do a prestige night. <laughs> So I was just talking about with my boyfriend. I need to watch that movie. Um, okay. Hot take. It is Nolan's best film. I believe yeah, okay. I agree. Let's all watch it this week. Okay. Um, <laughs> my movie is, is Bridesmaids. I've seen it the most. I, I actually, in high school, my best friend, Tanya, and I, we turned it into a speech for our speech and debate team. And we performed the entire movie of Bridesmaids as a speech and competed uh nationally and we like i think we came in like seconds for state wow. so you guys memorized the film between the two of you oh yeah and like well we had to like cut it down to make it a speech but it was like you know, it was like a 15 minute speech so you condense the movie into like a speech where you transition into these weird characters and so you like play like it's weird i don't know but you yeah have films anywhere because that's a that's a wild it's actually i just found the speech physical the physical copy we've been looking for the video it's somewhere that scene where the, like uh, Kristen Wiig and Meyer giving the or um, Rose are giving the actual speech, the dueling it, speeches. That's my favorite scene. And like they start speaking in Spanish, yeah, with yeah. each other. That was in our speech. My um my high school graduation. My best friend and I hosted like a like a joint um celebratory dinner and her father my dad I think was the first to give a speech and then her dad gave a speech and then it was right when bridesmaids to come out so my dad got up and like <laughs> going <laughs> like, like, just kidding just kidding like bridesmaids you know <laughs> that's amazing um all right so Kendall back to you the song that you have on repeat at the moment it's you know constantly the song but it's the less I know the better tame and Paula. So good. Classic. Nina? Um, I've been listening to Lana Del Rey's new album, Chemtrails Over the Country Over the Country Club. Um, I've just been listening to the album on repeat every time I'm in the car. Mine's quite embarrassing, but I just heard Driver's License for the first time a couple weeks ago. I don't know where I've been. I don't know what I've been doing, especially because our friend Logan shot the music video. But I don't know. I just like was under a rock. And uh, <laughs> I guess that means you don't have TikTok. I don't. I don't have TikTok. Well, I don't either. It's okay. It's okay. I watch enough for the three of us. So <laughs> <laughs> That came in handy in quarantine. Like our friend Becca recommended I download the app. I was like, what is this? I could waste three hours and the day would be over He's so like, you know, like real pandemic it was a savior i don't like it yeah it's yeah you know hit or miss for some people <laughs> um all right nina the weirdest location you filmed in um my mind goes to the middle of the kazakh step that was probably on a horse farm it was like five hour drive remote farmland in the middle of kazakhstan it was probably a the most bizarre, but amazing. Wow. Kendall. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I do. I like the only thing that's coming to mind, which is not that interesting is um, I've shot in several grocery stores uh, because I've done like a lot of commercials for grocery stores. And then the only other thing that's kind of strange is like, I did um when we were doing the proof of concept short for when jeff we did like we had a hospital scene but i couldn't afford to use a real hospital 
So I used my uncle's unopened surgery center at the time. Like it was like opening like two weeks later. So we shot in there and just like made it look like a hospital. I don't know. Yeah. Um, in college, I was assigned to be the boom operator on a fellow Chapman student's short film. And he just so happened to be Hugh Hefner's son. So we shot oh. at the Playboy Mansion. Yes. Yeah. That is dope. I did not know you were on that. Yeah. Yeah. It was a lovely boom up all weekend. Um, all right, Kendall, a book you, any book, even if it's already been adapted, but any book that you would want to adapt yourself into a film? Um, I really wanted to do Black Hole, which is like a graphic novel. Um, I'm a famous filmmaker is, is doing it. It's like in the works right now. Um, and I'm completely forgetting what it is, but it's like a sci-fi about STDs. Mm. Um, like a coming of age yeah it's great um my friend Gia recommended it interesting I mean it's a little bit like follow me was a horror film about STDs yeah um that's that's exactly wait follow me no that was my short film yeah I was like wait follow me was a short film you made and I was on (laughs) not a horror follow something it follows yeah it's it's similar to that but a little like more of like a coming of age like Mm. um it's not as scary Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Nina. Um. I. I don't know. I mean, the first book like that had an impact on me was, or that I loved was The Great Gatsby. I think I would remake it though, and like reverse all the gender, mm-hmm. make it all a female-led cast. That's that cool. Was- I'm surprised they haven't done that yet. Actually. Yeah, I think they should do more like remakes of other classics where the r- roles are reversed yeah I think that's a good idea why aren't we running studios yeah um all right Nia what was the last movie that you saw in theaters um you know I think it was the Joker I was just talking to Lauren Sick about it who's a fellow director friend because we saw it at Arclight and we were just reminiscing last night about it with the set unfortunate and tragic news and she's like we saw joker there it was the last movie we'll ever see and i was like i think that's the last movie i actually saw in theaters mm-hmm. yeah. sorry that's such a that's a downer I, know. I was just thinking the same thing i was like the last movie i saw i know it was it it was either at the dome or is at arc light um wait maria you go first because I'm, I'm trying to remember what mine was the gentleman which was at the the oh. landmark in santa monica which was surprisingly a fun film it was fun. Love Colin Farrell in that movie. I think mine was The Gentleman too. Oh, really? Yeah. I'm looking at my my letterbox list and I'm pretty sure that's what it was. Yeah, it was probably, I think it was like January or February. So yeah, it was, it was, right, it was right before I rewatched all the Harry Potter movies, Nina. So that <laughs> means quarantine. Um, yeah, it was the gentleman. Quarantine content. Yeah. All right. And then lastly, um, Kendall, a guilty pleasure movie. Actually, you know what, Nerling, you know what? I have a better one. A movie, a classic film that you should have seen by now that you have not. That's embarrassing that you have it. Oh my God. Um, so many. It's really like quite embarrassing. Uh, I guess The Godfather. Yeah, same, I haven't seen it. Okay, cool, I feel bad. Mine the sister, mine is Goodfellas. All right. I watched that two years ago, so. Yeah. Yeah. Godfather one and two are, are good, like a good double feature weekend. Mm. Drink red wine, eat your pasta. First, we watch yeah. The Prestige, then we do Godfather one and two. Yeah, that's a nice appetizer. Yeah. That sounds really nice. Um, I, okay, I do have one more. What about a film? I mean, I'll start this with you. A guilty pleasure film. Um. Can you define guilty pleasure? I feel like people have very, very- I, You know, it is a very broad term, but I guess something that's a little bit like trashy or like gauche, like, you know, it's a little embarrassing, but you're like, you know what, screw it. You don't think it's high class, but it's for me. Um, I don't know if this is like, I really like watching the uh, Rent movie with Adina Menzel. I don't know if that's guilty pleasure, but that's yeah. like- Totally I, sang all the, I sang all the lyrics and, I, and it's like me time, a me time film alone. 
it, it is therapeutic. I probably once a year, I have to put it on and I grab my karaoke mic and I just do the whole yeah. thing. Okay. We're going to do that next time we can hang out. Kendall, what about you? Um, I'm going to group it together and just say like any Will Ferrell movie. Mm. I love Will Ferrell comedies. I mean, I would say Step Brothers like a close second to how many times I've like Bridesmaids. I've seen it a lot. Um, even the bad ones. I love every, I love him. I love everything he does. You know, which one I watched of his recently that it was so the opposite of PC, but I was cackling the whole time. Um, one of him and Kevin Hart. Oh, oh my God. Yeah. Um, oh, what is it called? I just saw it a few weeks ago and I forgot. Is he, is he like your crush, like your celebrity crush, would you say? He's not my celebrity crush, but like, I actually think he might be one of the actors I dream of working with the most. Like, there's a long list, but I just think he is incredible. Like his newest movie, Eurovision, it's ridiculous, but it is so funny. Like, I sometimes just want to like completely release, laugh and not think about a thing. And for me, that's what his movies do. Hmm. Also, have you guys seen Barb and Star go to Vista Del Mar? He did. I did. That was very funny. He so. produced that. And I thought it was amazing. It was, uh, it was actually, um, that was a good, I don't know if that was guilty pleasure, but maybe, but that was a really fun yeah. one. Yeah. Maria, you haven't seen it? No. It's called yeah. what? Barb and Star go to Vista Del Mar. It's, it's Kristen Wiig and Annie Momolo who wrote Bridesmaids together. Okay. They are in it the new Gloria Sanchez movie, which is, you know, the sister company of Will Ferrell's retired company, Gary Sanchez. Mm. So I think it's, it's on, is it on HBO or Apple TV, maybe? Something on Apple TV, Hulu. Yeah, it's good. Um, okay, good. I need a good laugh. Guillermo del Toro really likes it, which made me secure <laughs> in my decision of liking the film. Maybe. Very interesting. I, I mean, that's what I love about this medium. It's, you know, just having a broad appreciation for art and not just thinking like, you can only like this certain type of film. It's like, I'm sorry, you can appreciate any type of film, be it comedy, be it horror, like a good film that moves you can like fall into any genre. Yeah. That's why I'm really, thank you, Maria, for not asking what's your favorite film, because that's my least favorite question. No, it's impossible. It, especially because like every day it could change like there's a certain day where I'm like my favorite film today will be this and then tomorrow like I, I don't know it's just yeah yeah um well ladies this was so fun thank you We're already um, yeah already I know I know it's been <laughs> we've been gabbing away but uh yeah I'm I feel honored that you I, ha I have this friendship with both of you and I really I truly am grateful that you wanted to like hop on and just chat through what it's like to be a young female director in this world um do you guys have any last questions thoughts you want to share um thank you for having us my love I would just say if there are any young females listening um like dm message email female directors ask to shadow them ask to assist them that's something i do on every single set i have um someone who wants to direct be my assistant so um please just know it it's possible yeah that's a really that's really good advice um thanks for having us maria this, it was so nice to meet you nina i look forward to continuing to watch your work and and watching the prestige together i'm ready for that whenever you guys are i'm gonna have to try really hard to not quote a lot of the film kendall so it's okay though i'll just i'll watch it the day before we watch it so i get it out of my system okay. it'll be <laughs> way back for when we'd watch new girl together exactly <laughs> um anyways i just i want to give a quick shout out to the rest of the team at film roundtable uh we have aaron wilde doug torres and matthew wolf my co-founders as well as bradford young and my sister jimena prieto who has just joined the team I, I know exciting um i want to help want to thank all of our listeners for your continued support and just remember you can listen to these anytime when you subscribe to our podcast and follow us on instagram at film roundtable and you can also follow both of these ladies at Nina Meredith and at Kendall Gold Goldberg Films. So we will see you all soon. Bye guys.